I'm Dan. Um, been working here at the biochar facility at Living Wind Farms for a number of years now, and um, uh, really enjoying this aspect of leading workshops, especially on these um, somewhat fringe topics that, um, you know, I may get online and I may do a little bit of research and find that there's some gaps in things that are being said online and then um, follow up research that's available to maybe non-professionals um, like ourselves. One of those gaps is absolutely in the realm of wood ash. I would say that um, the internet will tell you a lot of things that you can do with wood ash. And uh, if you get on there and you say like, what can I do with my wood ash? You'll come up with a list of 100 things you can do with wood ashes. And um, I will tell you from experience and uh, digging a little bit deeper, a lot of other people's experience that you cannot really, I, I cannot preserve tomatoes with wood ash. That was uh, kind of a non-starter for me. Um, my tomatoes were lasting maybe about two or three weeks packed in wood ash when some of the claims out there were pretty outrageous. Um, not to say it can be done, but to say that we should approach a lot of this with caution. Um, here is a long keeper tomato that I put in about less than a month ago. Stored in the dark, in the basement, packed in wood ash. I, you know, I checked all the boxes. People were saying they were getting you know, I should expect six months of storage or something. So um, that's not necessarily telling me that they're wrong. What that's telling me is that there's some, maybe some variables here that we don't fully understand. Um, let me say first here that I am not a chemist. So um, I'm going to wade through the chemistry lessons here very cautiously. And uh, anybody here have any chemistry training at all? Okay, um, that's gonna make it easier for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, so I will say, you know, I know a lot of our videos get a pretty good online presence. So um, I'm gonna welcome comments um, to either correct or explain uh, further any kind of chemistry that I'm gonna try to, uh, to do. Um, one place to look, if you're a layman such as myself and really haven't studied chemistry since high school, I cannot recommend this book any further. I love this book to death. I think it's so fun. And um, it has been really enlightening for me looking at everyday objects and trying to explain the chemistry of it. Caveman Chemistry by Kevin Dunn. Um, fantastic book. Uh, since we're doing this, he also has a book on scientific soap making, which I've enjoyed thoroughly as well. And um, another one that I just came across a few days ago and Got the Amazon Prime mode and got it here just in time. How to bake without baking powder. Um, so this is, uh, it has some very clear um, instructions on uh, using wood ash as a substitute for baking powders, which is kind of fun. I didn't uh, get it in time to actually make some biscuits, um, but uh, if I got it one day earlier, uh, maybe could have done that for you. Um, yeah, I approach this, I, I would probably say, um, probably from the soap aspect of it. I had heard about wood ash soap some many years ago, maybe as a Boy Scout, and always just kind of thought, yeah, I should try that someday. And then I uh, kind of got into making soap at home uh, over the past couple years, just been piddling with it. But um, yeah, just made an effort to collect all my wood ashes that I burned in my stove last year, and then uh, invited a, a couple other folks from the farm to do that as well. So we rounded up quite a, quite a bit of ashes between three or four people. Um, anyway, wood ashes, what are they? The inorganic mineral residue left behind after the complete combustion of wood. So what is in wood ashes depends on many, many, many factors. Um, the species of the wood, the age of the wood, so your um, prunings, you said you have an orchard. Your prunings, the twiggy prunings, are going to have much more ash in them than the heartwood of an oak tree that you're burning in your wood stove. And the composition of that ash may be quite a bit different. And uh, bark is going to have a lot more silica in it. It's, you're going to get more ash from burning bark, but it's uh, likely going to be less potent in terms of nutrients. Um, temperature of combustion, believe it or not, has a huge factor, and I'm going to demonstrate that in a few uh, with all these little jars. Might shed some light on that. Um, and 
included this other line too, the conditions between combustion, so when you go to pull it out of your wood stove, the conditions between that point and when you actually use them are going to affect the composition of the wood ash. That wood ash is going to change over time. And um, lastly, um, organic residues. So this is, um, you know, that includes charcoal that's in your ash, but it also includes um, uh, condensed wood smoke vapors that, that may be kind of mixed in with your ashes. And the easiest way to tell that, if you have um, high organic residues in your char or in your ash, it's basically just going to be looking at the color of the ash. Note, um, let's do this right here. Take a look at this ash right here. Okay, notice the color. Yeah, watch your lungs there. Okay, kind of white. I would say that's whitish. Yeah, in terms of, um, and let's compare that to the ash that was in my tomatoes. And maybe this is why my tomatoes don't work. Notice the color difference. Quite a, quite a dramatic color difference. Now, that indicates to me a lower temperature burn, maybe kind of like a smoldering fire, um, smoky mess. Definitely not as pure. Yeah, absolutely not as pure. Because of recondensed gases? I think so. You know, I didn't find any literature to, to prove that. But um, we'll get into this process in a minute, but this is about as clear a, as it gets, the difference between those two ashes. What is that? <laughs> this is what, and, and half of this workshop is going to be about what do you do with the water that passes through wood ashes, okay? Um, this water came through those white ashes, and this water came through my old ashes, okay? So um, no doubt that amber color in there is due to some complex organic molecules that have dissolved in that solution. Does that make sense? Uh, just, uh, we'll get this kind of stuff out of the way. Um, handling and storage, you know, when you move your ashes out of your stove, a lot of this stuff is really obvious. You're gonna put it in a metal bucket, don't put it in a plastic bucket, especially if it's hot, because your plastic bucket might melt. One thing you might not uh, totally get, and I, and I would understand that, is this zinc um, galvanized, old homestead looking pail that you know, people love because it looks all rustic and it looks nice sitting next to your wood stove. Now, if you put really hot coals in that, you're going to start to burn off some of that zinc and you're going to create some pretty nasty gases inside your home. So that's one thing just to kind of pay attention to. Um, I use this and it's buried under here. Just a cheap old, yeah, I know, right? An old enamel pot. Something that when I scoop my ashes out, I can Put it in there and close it real quick before that flume of dust comes up and just makes my house that much messier, right? And once they've totally cooled, I like to take them and move them out and put them into a plastic bucket and seal it up tight, okay? Um, do not quench your ashes um, with water. Yeah, unless, if you wanna do anything with them later on down the line, try to keep them as dry as you can. I'll explain that later. Um, obviously, it's really bad for your lungs, you know, to be breathing that dust, protect your eyes. That kind of thing. Um, See, so this is your first wood stove that you guys mm -hmm. have had. Do you, do you guys have the tools? Do you have a little shovel? Do you have an ash rake? No, we even think it's missing some pieces. It's an old Vermont casting from the 1970s. Okay. Yeah, one thing I like to do is um, I, I keep an ash rake, and I like to rake my coals forward in the stove and kind of push my ashes towards the back. Um, that's a way that you can completely burn your charcoal. You get it close to your air vent, so you can burn your, your char really hot. And then you'll get really nice pure ashes by doing that, too. Um, so definitely invest in an ash rake, OK? Pull that charcoal right up next to your air vents when it's nice and hot. OK, wood ash composition. Um, around here, you can pretty much count on it being about 25 to 40% calcium. Nutrient-wise for your soil, um, five to ten percent potassium, and one percent phosphorus. Okay, those are your your main nutrients for garden applications that you're going to get out of wood ashes. A uh, lot of micronutrients. Um, there are some um, soluble compounds and some insoluble compounds. 
do you guys remember insoluble and soluble from, from your high school chemistry days? Soluble means it dissolves in water. Um, insoluble means it does not dissolve in water. Um, there is um, uh, soluble alkali. Okay, these are going to be compounds that are, that are basic in water, so it's the opposite of acidity. And um, mostly in the form of potassium and calcium because they're very uh, uh, high concentrations in your wood ash. And then uh, they're going to form salts that are uh, predominantly carbonates. And then there's some hydroxides. Who's heard of um, calcium carbonate? Who's heard of calcium bicarbonate? Who's heard of sodium bicarbonate? Because Bacon soda? Some of these things aren't, aren't terribly bad. And what about sodium hydroxide? That's a drain cleaner. That's lye. I thought that was a cleaning for the wall cleaner or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So that's lye. And then potassium hydroxide is, is uh, nearly as strong as sodium hydroxide. It's just a potassium salt. Okay, so that's a lye that you can also use as a, as a drain cleaner. Um, there are some hydroxides in very pure um, wood ash that's been burned hot. Okay, so your white ashes are going to potentially have some hydroxide. So, um, you know, drain cleaner, be careful when you're handling this stuff, especially if you're wet. Okay, your eyes are really going to burn if you get really, like, nice pure wood ashes in your eyes. Or, um, you know, if your hands are wet and you go sticking them in nice fresh ash. You're going to get a soapy feel, and that's the, uh, that's the hydroxides that are working there. There are some non-alkali uh, soluble salts in there as well, chlorides and sulfates. And I'm about to blow your mind. And just oh, not one slide next. I'm going to blow your mind. This is a, uh, an analysis. Uh, I think this costs, I can't remember, I think $10 to have my samples of wood ash sent to um, North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And they'll analyze it. And, um, uh, tell you, you know, they're assuming that you're going to take that and, and cast it on your soil. So they're giving you a soil nutrient analysis here. Uh, it's $10, I think, for the base test. It's around there. And then you can uh, pay extra to have the heavy metal test included. You can pay extra to have the cation exchange test in there. I, I did, no, that was from my other soil sample. Anyway, you can see, remember we said it was going to be roughly 25% um, to 40% calcium. My calcium content in my wood ash is 26.8. My potassium is pretty low. It's 4.7. Phosphorus is like 0.6%. So pretty low in phosphorus. Low-ish in potassium. Calcium is rather low, but still on target with what the estimates are. Um, fairly low down here in heavy metals. I will say that these are uh, pretty low concentrations of heavy metals. I read a little bit about lead um, this morning, and it's uh, pretty common to see 10 to 50 percent parts per million lead in your garden soil as it is. Is that because of um, like exhaust emissions and stuff? That, that is, is that? I think that's naturally occurring. I'm, I'm not. That's, I'm just curious about that. That's... Yeah, I mean, so your lead is going to build up in your soil if you know if somebody's been dumping paint there for a long time or, or, you know, I guess changing their oil or something and throwing it out in the yard. You know, those, those kind of factors are going to increase the lead content. But uh, I, I, I say this because I kind of want you to kind of feel safe about the heavy metal content in wood ash. That's something that comes up a lot. It's very important to look at um, if you're doing anything like burning treated wood or um, uh, using some sort of industrial ash in a garden application especially, or food application. Um, let's see, calcium carbonate equivalent, we're going to come back to that right there. And this is the agricultural lime equivalent. Any questions about this? Check out my carbon content here, 8.7%. That's pretty impure, I would say. OK. <laughs> So this is fun for me. Um, this was a, a huge surprise. We are, remember, talking about the soluble salts that are in wood ash and the insoluble um, material. So the way that we're separating the um, soluble from the insoluble is basically taking it and putting your ashes in a container, 
that can handle the alkalinity, right? So you've got to have a chemically resistant container. Uh, polypropylene works fine. Uh, high density polyethylene, plastic number two, works great. Stainless steel works great. Glass works great. Aluminum, forget about it. Do not do this with aluminum pot. It's very reactive to the alkalinity. It's, um, it, it gets messy and poisonous pretty fast. Um, so I'm taking wood ashes and uh, passing water through them. Is there a filter on the bottom of that top cap? There's a tiny, tiny, tiny hole. In uh, these, I just took a thumbtack and just pressed it in there and removed it. So that hole is as small as I can get. And it takes about a day. And uh, this, so this solution that it looks like water is what's coming out. But um, that stuff is going to be very rich in potassium carbonate, um, uh, potentially potassium hydroxide, um, some other salts as well. Um, this is an example. I was getting pretty deep into the experimentation stuff around here. Uh, set it up like I normally would and um, came up with this uh, pretty crazy green stuff. Let me show you what I did. Chasing uh, another thing that I saw online where a guy um, took his wood ash and soaked it through this container took his soluble stuff, in this case, and threw it out, OK? And then he took this ash that's left over, and he re reheated it to uh, a cherry red color. So he took it up to about 1,250 degrees, I think, because that's how hot I took this ash. No, that's wrong. 1,500 degrees is how hot I took this. And I'm going to show you why I took it too hot. This is what my ash looked like after I took it. After I cooked my ash that had already had the soluble stuff rinsed out. And I took my ash and I cooked it up to 1,500 degrees in my little oil burner. And take a look at that stuff. You see the little blue crystals there? <laughs> right. So, um, there's no practical application for this. Just um, I just thought it was really neat. But um, took this stuff and powdered it up, and then I added water back to it. Okay, and this is the immediate color of that water that I added back to it. This like brilliant green, and I got crazy excited and thought that maybe I was some some kind of uh, alchemist. alchemist. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like maybe I get knighted for this. And uh, um, got real excited and immediately just started asking anybody I knew who, who had a chemistry background, what's going on here? Got all kinds of responses. Um, and then set it aside and was very disappointed to see this um, stuff drop out of solution overnight. Um, and, the, and the solution turned yellow. And having got in and actually looked at it, I believe that this is a um, iron carbonate, um, possibly a carbonate hydroxide. It's called green rust. But um, it's a uh, really complex salt. And the iron goes into suspension, right? And um, when it gets oxidized, the iron will drop out of suspension. This is definitely a question, uh, a, a case for the internet comments. I would love to see what, where that goes, if anybody knows more about that. But uh, point is, there's a lot more going on in here than just um, potassium salt and calcium. Okay, pretty complex stuff. It's going to be a lot different um, when applied to your your soils than just uh, getting a bag of lime. Okay. <laughs>